Okay. I want to thank you all for coming and thank you for your patience this morning. The sudden death of the county executive has been a shock to everyone in the local government community and it's taken us a little bit of time to uh, gather some information to provide to you all this morning. Um, I'm Elise Armacost. I'm the Public Affairs Director for the Baltimore County Fire Department. And I want to uh, explain to you, first of all, that the purpose of this briefing is to provide some detail about Mr. Kamenitz's medical emergency and the fire and EMS response to it. I've asked two people to be here to assist with this briefing. To my right is Dr. Gail Cunningham. She is the Chief Medical Officer at the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center. And to my left is Fire Director Richard Schenning. Uh, Rich oversees our EMS division. If you have specific questions about EMS, he is our expert. What I'm going to do uh, is to provide a linear account of this morning's events until the point at which we delivered Mr. Kamenetz to the hospital. Director Schenning, as I said, is our expert on EMS matters, so uh, if, you, if we get into any kind of uh, nitty-gritty about that, I'm going to defer to him. Excuse me just a minute. My throat is really dry this morning. Okay. So, let me begin <clears throat> at, at the beginning. Shortly after 2 a.m. this morning, the Baltimore County 911 Center received a 911 call from the county executive complaining of tightness in the chest. He said on the call that he was making the call from the Chestnut Ridge Volunteer Fire Company. The 911 call awakened two members of the Chestnut Ridge Volunteer Fire Company who were sleeping at the station. They went down to the parking lot where they met the county executive and his wife. At this point, the county executive was conscious and he was speaking. The Chestnut Ridge members took him into the station to begin an evaluation and basic life support care when the county executive's condition quickly deteriorated. He lost consciousness, he lost a pulse, and his heart stopped beating. Chestnut Ridge provided CPR manually and with a Lucas CPR device, which is an automated CPR device. They also used an automated external defibrillator to try to restore his heart rhythm. At one point, volunteer personnel did manage to restore his pulse, and they administered an IV to prepare him for advanced life support measures to be provided by career EMS personnel who were en route from the garrison fire station. However, his condition again deteriorated and CPR and, and uh, excuse me, Chestnut Ridge personnel continued to treat the county executive with CPR and defibrillation. Uh, they, the, the personnel from Chestnut Ridge defibrillated Mr. Kamenetz a total of three times prior to the arrival of the ALS team from Medic 19 out of the Garrison Fire Station. When Medic 19 arrived, they immediately began advanced life support measures, including administration of cardiac medications and airway management. Uh, Mr. Kamenetz was transferred uh, into Medic 19 and prepared for transport. ALS care continued throughout the transport to St. Joseph. The medic uh, was in emergency mode with lights and sirens the entire way to the hospital. Four EMS professionals rode in the medic with the county executive, an EMT who was the driver, a paramedic, uh, an EMS supervisor, and uh, our fire department medical director who is a licensed a licensed physician at St. Joe's he was immediately transferred to the care of the hospital staff and at that point I'm going to turn uh, the podium over to Dr. Cunningham uh, to talk about the, the hospital's role in his care thank you um, so per protocol um, en route to the hospital, we were notified not of who was coming, but that a full cardiac arrest was coming to St. Joe's, so our team is fully prepared. 
Um, our nurses and emergency medicine phys physician were prepared at the bedside when Mr. Kamenetz arrived. He was in full cardiac arrest, uh, receiving CPR, um, and he had a, um, a heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, which is very difficult to treat. Our team continued with the full advanced um, cardiac life support, uh, attempting to de further defibrillate him and uh, manage him medically, and very unfortunately were unable to ever restore a heartbeat and pro pronounced him uh, dead right around 3.20 uh, this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions. So you're aware of any heart element that you may have had beforehand? No, not aware. So you're not aware, or he, do you know if he did or not? You're not aware, or? The, the, so whether he had a heart, you just don't know. I don't know, right, right. Explain what you said was an unusual, difficult to treat. What exactly was that? So um, he had something called ventricular fibrillation, um, which is a sign of the heart not getting good blood supply at all. Um, the heart is an electrical organ, and so it's normally conducting electricity in a very methodical and, um, and systematic way. And when the heart is severely damaged and not getting a blood supply, the electricity flows uh, across the heart very abnormally. Um, and so it's why we have the AEDs out in the community, because sometimes you can reverse that with, with a defibrillator. Unfortunately, his was, I think, to the point of, of just not being able to return to normal. Doctor, Does that describe come? whether or not this is a, a common thing that you all see frequently in your business? Cardiac arrest? Well, in this, the, the, uh, the arrhythmia that you're describing, is this a fairly common thing? This is a very common arrhythmia that we see when somebody has a cardiac arrest, yes. Um, common with a very serious heart attack. Um, uh, and, and sometimes can be resuscitated in the field or in the hospital, but many times cannot be. We just had a description of the life-saving efforts, which included uh, the AED or something like it, which many people see in their workplaces and, and other places. Uh, could you describe the importance of those devices, regardless of the outcome here? Oh, that, that, so prompt defibrillation of this ventricular fibrillation can often restore a normal, back to a normal heart rate and has been life-saving in, in several um, instances. Um, so the sooner that you can apply it and begin defibrillation, uh, the, hopefully the better the chance that the patient will survive. And does this happen in healthy people or does it tend to happen in people who already have heart problems? Um, it, it's often most associated with somebody who's having a sudden cardiac event um, usually a sudden heart attack. Rarely we will see it just happen spontaneously in a, in a young person, but that's much more rare. Hey, Lise, could you talk to us a little bit about um, how far away Mr. Kamenetz lives from the firehouse and, and whether or not you have any information about why he and his wife made a decision to go there as opposed to call for home, uh, anything like that that you could share with us, please? I'm not certain of exactly how far from the fire station he he lives. Um, I do not know why he made the decision to drive to Chestnut Ridge rather than to call 911 from home. We just have no way of knowing that. Well, at least earlier, I think it was in the press release, um, you had um, written that he, he woke up feeling ill and complained that he uh, felt ill. Is that part of the timeline? Did he wake up feeling ill and then go to the Chestnut Ridge? And does that push back the timeline of events at all? No, not really. I mean, that, that, is, that is our understanding, that he woke up at home, said he was not feeling well, and said that he wanted to, to go to the Chestnut Ridge Volunteer Fire Company. Again, why he made that decision as opposed to calling 911 from home, I can't answer that question. Um, I, I just can't answer that. But it, it doesn't really change the timeline at all. A question for the doctor, if I might. Um, given the, the type of uh, heart attack that this appears to be and, and the decision that was made to go to the volunteer fire company instead of calling 911 and the time that elapsed in there, would it have made a difference had they called 911 and, and, and been uh, treated directly by, um, by EMS and then taken directly to the hospital as opposed to, to the steps that were taken in between the, the time that he was uh, taken to St. Joe? I really don't know. Um, obviously, with these, these conditions, time is everything, but I don't know for how long he was suffering at home with, with chest pain or symptoms uh, before he chose to do that. 
Um, we obviously always uh, um, really strongly urge people with sudden symptoms like this to call 911 to activate um, emergency care as quickly as possible. Is, is that the type of thing that would actually go from your sleep usually as well? Because oftentimes the, people that have cardiac arrest might not even wake right, up. Right, right. So, like but pain in your chest would, would often wake somebody up. And, and how long can you survive with your heart not beating? I mean, how long until you start getting brain damage? Oh, just minutes. Minutes. Yeah, yeah. I think for um, anyone who maybe called a loved one this morning and said, you know, don't stop eating donuts or, you know, I love you, that kind of thing, there's the question of was was this volunteer fire station perhaps on the way to the hospital? That's, I, you know, without, was he perhaps in the car going to the hospital? I could, we could understand if he felt too bad, just pull over here, let's, I, mean, I know there's EMTs. Can you give us an idea of maybe the we route would have taken? Was this on the way? Yeah, we, we have no idea. We, we just can't answer that question. We're not in a position to answer that question. What we know, uh, the facts as we know them, are that he made a 911 call from the parking lot, it appears, of the Chestnut Ridge Volunteer Fire Company. Why he chose to make that decision, you know, or where, he, whether he had some other intention, that's not a question that we can answer. So for the doctor, if someone has a heart attack and disability, would it be something that they would know over time? Would it be small uh, things that may have happened? That sometimes, so, um, and for background, I am an emergency medicine physician, so um, sometimes um, patients will have symptoms, uh, you know, beforehand where they've gotten a little bit of chest pain or shortness of breath when they're exerting themselves, but other times we've seen, you know, athlete, marathon athletes running and um, with no precipitating signs at all and, and collapse. So it, um, everybody's different. So at least you gave us a detailed account of what occurred and, and the doctor right. made a point of saying we didn't know who was coming. This was a Baltimore County citizen like everyone else. Could you characterize uh, uh, the response and the way you dealt with this and whether anything was special happened or is this the kind of care that's demonstrated throughout the county at all times? Our review of this call shows that it was handled uh, the same way as we would handle any call where someone showed up at a fire station or any 911 call. I mean, we had a patient that was dealing with a critical medical situation, and the response reflects exactly that. One thing I do want to clarify, I just was getting a little bit of information from Rich. Our information is that he, he lives about two miles from that station. I know it was nearby, but I didn't know exactly Small how. Detail. Do you know if his wife was driving or was he driving? I don't know the answer to that question. So the medical personnel that rode with him in the ambulance to the hospital, um, that, that's common before rumors of the fire that they had heard that they had been in the hospital. Yeah, the medical director. Yeah, so, so a, a typical response for that is we have AL, ALS and BLS units that are out there. Um, advanced life support units can provide cardiac medications and some advanced procedures. Um, with that, we also have EMS supervisors that are in the area. Um, they cover and oversee portions of the county. Um, with this, there was a call made to the medical director. I'm not sure how. Um, the medical director, I believe, is also um, lives very close to the Chestnut Ridge Volunteer Fire Company, and I believe he may also be a member there, and he would get some of those alerts. He responded to the scene to assist with our EMS supervisor and the ALS and the BLS crews. I have one question for you. In the initial response by the volunteer firefighters that were there, did they do everything that the paid responders would have done? Absolutely. Um, so when they got there, and from what it sounds like, there was two people that were sleeping there. When they came down, they took him in um, to their station, and as they were interviewing him, he subsequently uh, de deteriorated. And when they did, they immediately started CPR. Um, with that, they maintain an airway. They start doing you know, what everybody would have learned in with CPR. Um, also, by doing that, they applied an external defibrillator. They defibrillated him and you know, prepared him for that. They went over and beyond, started an IV because they had the equipment there, which transitions nicely when the ALS providers show up so that they continue the care. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. A question. Is there, are, is the ambulance and the um, medics that were in the ambulance with them, are they equally prepared to, to 
save his life and, and restart his heart as you would be at a hospital in bed once you get him inside the, the ambulance itself? So the majority of calls, I'll, you know, and I'll defer also Dr. Cunningham, um, for the majority of calls when we get a cardiac arrest, there's very little difference in the first 10 to 15 minutes of the treatment that we're going to provide, whether it happens in the field or it happens in the um, emergency department. You know, the crux of that, and people are asking the importance of CPR, the importance of alt um, defibrillating someone, that doesn't change whether you're in the hospital or you're out of the hospital. Um, this things which are a little bit more advanced, like starting IVs, giving cardiac medications, advanced airway management, things like that. Um, our paramedics are equipped to do that, and they do that all the time. So um, I would say for the first 15, 20 minutes of a cardiac arrest, shy of something that needs to be done by a physician, it, very little difference in care between hospital and pre-hospital on cardiac arrest management. Right, and then we continue to follow the same algorithm. It's a very prescriptive a algorithm of when you should. Oh, sorry. Um, we, we continue the same algorithm, so um, it's very prescri prescriptive as far as when you defibrillate, how often, what meds you give, and how often, and so we continue on that, uh, on that same algorithm. And I, I might have missed it. Can you uh, repeat what time he arrived at the hospital? Uh, I don't have it memorized, but I believe it was right around 3 a.m. Okay. And was his heart stopped? There was not, yeah, he was getting CPR. He was, it was not spontaneously pumping at all. And is that from 2 a.m. when he, he himself made a 911 call to the time he was pronounced dead at 322, is that time period normal for a heart attack like this? Um, so, uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by normal, uh, yeah, but so, it's, so it's probably, it sounds like it was about an hour from the time he actually collapsed until the time he was pronounced um, dead, and um, that would be a, um, a significant period of time to be doing CPR um, and putting somebody th um, through the protocol of advanced cardiac life support. Um, so I think really everything was done for as long as was reasonably possible um, to manage his, his condition. So they revived him three times. No. No. Oh, I thought they no. defibrillated him. So, okay. So times. that's different than reviving. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain what that is then? It sounds like um, when he first collapsed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when he first collapsed at the at the station, they defibrillated him, and he may have gotten a, a pulse back after that first mm -hmm. defibrillation. Yes. But then that rapidly deteriorated again into ventricular fibrillation, and subsequent attempts to defibrillate did not get a pulse back. Can I clarify something? I just want to clarify something. After he lost consciousness at the station, he never regained consciousness again. Just a pulse. He just a pulse. They were able to get a pulse back at one point, but he never. If you're using the term revive, as in he came to or re re regained consciousness, once he collapsed and lost consciousness, he never regained consciousness again after that. Uh, Elise, a quick, a quick clarifying question. I, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. The county executive himself made the 911 call? That is correct. So during that hour of unconsciousness, he's not getting oxygen? Well, they were they, uh, effective CPR, and they were um, managing his airway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were doing everything they could to keep his circulation going, um, but it's never as good as your own heart um, beating on its own. And Elise, I'm, um, since you are... Uh, the spokesperson here for yeah. the county government. Uh, what happened? What is the process? Who's in charge? Okay. What's happening now? Yeah, I can answer that briefly, and then for more detailed information on that, I'm going to refer you uh, over to uh, Don Moeller in the county executive's office. But the short answer to your question is that the county charter specifies that the county administrative officer, who is Fred Homan, serves as the acting county executive until the county council appoints a replacement for the county executive to fill out his or her term. So Mr. Homan is in charge of the county as we speak, but the charter stipulates that he serves in an acting role until the county council decides on a replacement to fill out the county executive's term. So he's, do you expect him to speak to us today, hopefully, to, to hear what's going on there? I, can't, I, cannot, uh, I cannot speak for Mr. Homan. I would refer you to 
to to Don Moeller to ask that to answer that question. You've had an opportunity to talk to lots of people within the county this morning yes. as part of your job. Could you characterize for us just the sort of reactions uh, among colleagues and, right. uh, and, and every other place? Right. Well, I, I got a phone call around 2 o'clock, uh, well, after 2 o'clock, because this happened around 2.30 around this morning, and I certainly was totally shocked, as anyone would be. I've known the county executive since uh, myself, since the early 90s, when I was an editorial writer at the Baltimore Sun, and he was a first-term county councilman. So some of us have known him for a very long time. Um, and. Um, I was there when uh, the chief of staff was making phone calls to let people know and people were shocked and there were a lot of tears and disbelief. I mean, when someone who was seemed to be in the peak of health yesterday isn't with you today, uh, it's just a shocking thing and it's difficult to absorb. And I think that in the county government community, people are still struggling to absorb the fact that uh, this person is just not with us, and it's going to take a little bit of time, you know, for a lot of people to process that. Uh, as a person who served both in government and on the outside of government, can you uh, offer some thoughts about uh, his importance and legacy to modern county history? Um, well, I mean, he's been a public servant here in Baltimore County for a very long time as a councilman and as a county executive. And, uh, you know, I, he, obviously he was a, a candidate in the gubernatorial race. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to uh, leave it to, uh, uh, you take me a bit off, off guard with, with that one. <laughs> but uh, I think we're all still processing, you know, the loss of someone who obviously is our, our most, uh, arguably our most important figure here in government. Uh, when is an autopsy going to be performed? I'm sorry? When is an autopsy going to be performed? My understanding is that his family has declined to have an autopsy performed. Oh. I have a question for the doctor. I think you may have been asked if you knew he had a history or had a heart history problem. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, with somebody with this condition that he had, would his symptoms have been exhibited earlier? Or were there, could there have been warning signs that others who may be watching this um, Look for. Yes, I mean, not everybody. So some people just come in out of the blue having been seemingly perfectly healthy, but other people might notice that they're getting some chest, chest tightness. A typical story would be, I was exercising regularly with no problem, and now when I get on the treadmill, I notice at the end I'm getting a little bit of chest tightness or I feel a little bit more short of breath. And, and actually that's gotten worse. Last week it, got, it happened a little sooner and it happened, was more intense, and so you'll hear this pattern of escalating symptoms. Uh, of usually chest tightness, shortness of breath, sometimes nausea, sometimes sweatiness. Um, I don't know if he was having any of those things prior to this. So the short answer is yes, it, the it, symptoms could be exhibited, but not always? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, now we had talked about the personal history and potential of whether or not he had a pre-existing condition. Um, at least since you've known him for well right. over two decades now. Are, are you aware of any family history of heart disease or anything yeah. along those lines? No, I spoke, uh, that was obviously a question that I asked this morning when we were preparing for this briefing. And the answer to your question is no. Uh, by all accounts, he appeared to be in excellent health. He saw a doctor regularly. Uh, you, you've seen him. He, he did not, he was not overweight. He was a person that uh, ate well. He liked healthy foods. Um, he, he did not have any uh, health issues that anyone was aware of. So that makes this even more of a shock for people to deal with. He, he liked yogurt and granola and things like that. So th this was not a person who had unhealthy habits. So uh, we're, we're just, we're not seeing anything in his history that would indicate that a sudden event like this would happen. Anyone else? The ambulance that was in the hospital, did it uh, have lights and sirens on? Yes, it did, yes. And do you guys know, like, a, like, a, like a timeline of like when he was uh, treated uh, by the volunteer? Yeah, 
I, I don't have, I, I'm working on a, on a timeline. I don't have those times right now. Um, that's something that I'm still trying to put together. Dr. Cunningham, could the stress of the, the campaign contribute to? Hard to tell. Stress can be a contributor to um, heart problems, but not necessarily. Could you, mind, could you talk about the health factor? Because everybody we talked with this morning, all morning long, said he was the picture of health. He ate healthy. Uh, he announced this initiative last week to get rid of junk food in the county owned vending mm -hmm. machines. Uh, and it just comes on so suddenly. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for the average person out there who's watching this thinking, could that happen to me? Uh, it, it, is, is, I mean, they say it's a silent killer, but. Yes, yeah, so, so I think, you know, there are certain definite known risk factors for heart disease, right? Smoking, uh, you know, there's things we can control and things we can't control. So smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol are things that you can control. Um, exercising regularly and a proper diet, things you can control. Family history is not something you can control. And just the occasional, out of the blue, who knows why, um, it, it, it just happens. Um, usually this happens because a uh, blood vessel to the heart has suddenly become blocked, starves the heart of its, uh, of its uh, blood, which starves it of its oxygen, and it stops working. Uh, doctor, uh, forgive me, it's a, it's a word people use, and I'm sure people, uh, is this term we've heard, a widow-maker heart attack uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. Does this fall into that category of, uh, what does that mean to you? And, it you it know, might. People? That's a widowmaker is when one of the very large blood vessels that feeds the, pretty much the entire heart um, uh, is, is blocked. I don't know what his underlying pathology was, so I don't know if this is, was one vessel or maybe he had several that were borderline and all of a sudden one, one blocked. I don't know. Okay. It didn't get so far you were able to take catheterization or pictures. No, he never, he never met that criteria. Okay. Very good. Thank you.